Welcome to History, Mystery, and the Unexplained, the show where we explore everything from true crime to cryptids, the paranormal, and beyond. Today, we're going to look at U.S. presidential assassinations and the people who committed these treasonous crimes. But before we get started, please like, subscribe, follow, or whatever on the platform of your choice, and be sure to give us a review. I'd love to hear what you think. Now, Mentioned U.S. presidential assassinations, and two probably come to mind. The first, Abraham Lincoln's death at the hands of John Wilkes Booth. The second, Lee Harvey Oswald's assassination of John F. Kennedy, uh, with the help of that mystery shooter in the grassy knoll, of course. These, however, are not the only presidents to be assassinated, and certainly not the only attempted assassinations. In fact, 18 out of the 46 men to hold office have had attempts made on their lives. Some presidents have even had multiple attempts made against them. Bill Clinton had no less than six attempts on his life, and Barack Obama seven. These tales from history have generated their fair share of conspiracies, haunting tales, and the just plain bizarre. One of my favorite little legends. On January 30th, 1835, on the steps of the Capitol building, Richard Lawrence pulled out a single-shot pistol and fired. The gun failed. Without hesitation, Lawrence produced a second gun and pulled the trigger. Again, the shot failed. At this point, President Andrew Jackson, the target of the failed shots, reached Lawrence and began savagely beating him with his cane. U.S. Representative Davy Crockett... Davy! Davy Crockett! Yes, that Davy Crockett, and others pulled the men apart and subdued the would-be assassin. I can only imagine what Lawrence's fate would have been that day had the king of the wild frontier not been present. Lawrence was found innocent by reason of insanity and lived out his final days in the government hospital for the mentally insane in Washington, D.C. The next assassin on our list wasn't so lucky as to escape the death penalty due to reasons of insanity. Despite his lawyer George Scoville's best efforts, he was hanged to death for the assassination of James Garfield on June 30th, 1882. According to medical analysis, in his life and post-mortem, there is little doubt that Charles Guiteau suffered from serious mental illness. Charles Julius Guiteau was born in Freeport, Illinois in 1841. He was the fourth of six children conceived by Jane Howe and Luther Guiteau. His mother died in 1848, when Charles was only seven. Despite the fact that his father remarried, it is noted that his sister Frances took on the role of mother, providing Charles with both financial and emotional support well into his adult life. His childhood hardships didn't end with the death of his mother. His father raised his six children with a stern hand, beating them often. And Charles may have had it even worse than the others due to his short attention span and hyperactive behavior. In 1859, Charles Guiteau's maternal grandfather passed away, leaving him an inheritance of $1,000, equal to more than $40,000 today. He took the money and ran. Charles leapt at the opportunity to be free of his difficult upbringing and moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan, where he began attending classes at the University of Michigan. However, a year later, he dropped out and moved again, this time to Oneida, New York, where he joined the Oneida community. Yes, that Oneida. The same people whose flatware is on wedding registries everywhere. A funny little irony, since among the community's rather unorthodox beliefs is that of complex marriage, a belief that every member of the community is married to every other member of the community and thus allowed to engage in sexual intercourse. It was forbidden, however, to be attracted to or in love with anyone. Another of their beliefs is the form of birth control known as male continence, a practice of early withdrawal. Men were not allowed to ejaculate during copulation because of the belief that unwanted children were a waste of a man's seed, an equal sin to masturbation. Perhaps the most disturbing of the group's beliefs was that of ascending fellowship, an introductionary process where virgins were chosen by the community elders at the age of 14 to be guided into the marriage lifestyle. Communal living didn't suit Gateau very well. In his eyes, he was destined for greatness and had trouble seeing the rest of the community as his equals. In the eyes of at least one communal elder, Charles Gateau was of an unsound, insane mind and was noted for his refusal to do any work in the community and for his angry letters to John Humphrey Noyes, the community's founder, calling him a tyrant and an oppressor. 
Despite the community's criticism of him and his own criticism of the founder, Charles believed that it was his duty to spread noise word. In 1865, he moved to Hoboken, New Jersey, with aspirations of founding a theological newspaper called the Daily Theocrat. The ne paper never got off the ground, and within two months, he was back to New York. He left Oneida for good in 1866. After more failures and a certain degree of struggle, poor and without options, he turned to his sister Frances and her new husband, George Scoville. In August of 1867, Scoville offered Charles a job in his Chicago law office and even provided him with a place to live. And Charles accepted and moved to Chicago. But within that same year, he quit and returned again to New York. Another newspaper had caught his eye. Charles decided that he was going to write editorials for Henry Ward Breacher's newspaper, The Independent. Unfortunately, Breacher had other plans and offered Guteau only a job selling subscriptions. Before turning back to Chicago again, Guteau attempted to put together a lawsuit against John Humphrey Noyes and the Oneida community demanding retribution for services provided. He sent several letters to noise, threatening to reveal information to the public regarding the community's sexual exploits. But he gave up when the community's lawyers threatened him with charges of extortion. 1868 found Charles Guiteau back in Chicago, where he somehow passed the Illinois bar exam and opened up his own small law firm. The next year, he met and married Annie Bunn, a librarian at the local YMCA. When it came to being a family man, however, Guteau took a page out of his father's book. He beat Annie regularly and was even noted to have locked her in a closet at times for an entire night. She lasted five years with Guteau and another moved to New York before filing for divorce. The official reasoning used on the divorce papers was adultery. Guteau contracted syphilis while sleeping with a sex worker. After his divorce in 1874, it was back to Chicago and back to George and Francis Scoville's home. Guteau made one last attempt at journalism that year when he tried to purchase the Chicago Inner Office. Of course, as so much in Charles Guteau's life went, the newspaper didn't work out, nor did living with his sister. Perhaps it was the effects of years of stress and failure on an already disturbed mind. Perhaps it was the syphilis. Perhaps it was simply the next phase of his mental state. Whatever the cause in 1875, Guteau was chopping wood when he turned the axe on his sister. Luckily, she got away unharmed and retrieved a local doctor to examine her brother. The doctor advised that Charles be institutionalized, but instead, Guteau ran and disappeared for almost an entire year. When Charles Guteau reemerged in 1876, he had transformed himself into an evangelical preacher. After making regular appearances at Dwight L. Moody's revivalist meetings, Charles started writing and delivering his own sermons. Some described Guiteau's sermons as simply incoherent babbling, while others said that it was a direct ripoff of John Humphrey Noyes' preachings. In one newspaper's accounts of his sermons, they accused him of being a fraud and exploiting the audience's religious faith in an attempt to take their money. The article noted that Charles spoke for only 15 minutes before thanking them for their time and fleeing with the collection plate. If there is a hell, it insinuated, Guiteau would one day call it home. 1880 was an important year in Charles Guiteau's life. His father Luther died, and he set his sights on politics. 1880 was an election year, and the Republicans were divided in their support between Ulysses S. Grant, who was planning on running for a third term, and Garfield. James Garfield. Guiteau initially backed Grant, but when Garfield won the nomination for the party's support, Charles changed his allegiance. He gave several speeches in support of the future president. However, rather than writing new ones for Garfield, he simply changed a few lines of his original Grant speeches to include Garfield's name. In one of Guiteau's speeches, archived in the Georgetown University collection, it mentions Garfield in the introduction, then talks about Grant's accomplishment for a full two pages before bringing it back to Garfield in the concluding paragraph. After James Garfield was elected president, Charles Guiteau's delusions of grandeur took on an even more bizarre twist. He believed that it was his own speeches that had earned Garfield a seat in the White House. So in 1881, Charles 
Guiteau followed the president to Washington, D.C., where he began a letter-writing campaign to prominent Republicans, requesting his reward. Specifically, Guiteau believed that his assistance in the election had earned him a consulate position in either Vienna or Paris. After several failed attempts to contact the president and numerous unanswered letters to senators, Guiteau decided there was only one thing left to do remove the president for the good of the nation. He believed that this was what would finally put him in the history books. He was right, of course, but not in the way he thought. On July 2nd, 1881, Charles Guiteau shot President James Garfield twice. The second bullet lodged just behind the president's spleen. His weapon of choice, a 44 British Bulldog pistol with an ivory grip, a gun purchased because it would look good in a museum. From prison, Guiteau started a second letter-writing campaign, believing that he had done not just what the people had wanted, but what the Lord had wanted. One letter addressed to William T. Sherman read as follows. I have shot the president. I shot him several times, for I wished him to go as easily as possible. His death was a political necessity. I am a lawyer, theologian, and politician. I am going to jail. Please order out your troops to take possession of the jail at once. Sherman, of course, did not send out his troops, nor did the public honor him as a hero. After a lengthy trial, Guiteau was executed by hanging on June 30th, 1882. Acting in his defense was his brother-in-law, George Scoville, who tried to plead innocence by reason of insanity. The jury didn't buy it and convicted him of murder, perhaps in part because of Guiteau's repeated arguing with his own defense lawyer in the courtroom that he was not insane. There seems to be a small deal of debate about what became of Charles Guiteau's remains after his death. Officially, it is recorded that his body was moved to the National Museum of Health and Medicine in Washington, D.C., where doctors dissected his brain in an effort to discover the source of his insanity. There was also a plan to place his bones on display for the public to see. The museum went as far as stripping the corpse of flesh and bleaching the bones, but decided not to display them. It is here where the body is said to remain, categorized, labeled, and filed in a small cabinet in the museum's vault. Some local legends tell a different story. After the autopsy was finished, the skeleton was returned to the family. The legend goes that... They buried it in the basement of his father's Freeport home. This has led to tales of the Freeport home being plagued by hauntings from its former residents. Whether his bones were moved there or not, the Freeport home would still be a likely place for Charles' spirit to go. This, after all, is the only place he may have ever truly been able to call home. From 1859 until 1882, he was a wanderer. In 23 years, he lived in more than seven states, countless cities, and even more homes. It should also be noted that even though he left in 1859, his father remained in Freeport, as did the children of Luther's second marriage to Harriet Blood. Charles' half-sister Flora and his half-brother Luther W. In fact, all three died in Freeport, living there their entire lives. Flora was recorded to have died in Freeport in 1935 and Luther in 1944. They both officially denounced their brother in life and in death. But a home is a home, and blood is blood. It's interesting to note that Robert Todd Lincoln, son of Abraham Lincoln, was nearby three of the four successful assassinations of U.S. presidents. When his father was shot at the Ford's Theater on April 14, 1865, Robert was at the White House and was quickly whisked away to his parents' side so he could say goodbye. On July 2, 1881, he was at the Baltimore and Potomac Railroad Station to witness the shooting of James Garfield. Finally, On September 6th, 1901, he found himself just outside the Temple of Music when Leon Shogat shot President William McKinley. It is claimed that in response to one invitation to the White House, he said, If only they knew they wouldn't want me there. There is a certain fatality about presidential functions when I am present. Now, this, of course, is not the last time he was in the presence of a sitting president, but it is not surprising that at times he viewed himself cursed. Before 
we look at the death of William McKinley and his assassin, Leon Shogat, I want to tell one more tale about Robert Todd Lincoln. One day, a year or two prior to his father's death, depending on the report, Robert Lincoln was transferring between trains in New Jersey on his way to D.C. The crowd pushed forward, trying to be the first to get to the conductor to buy a ticket onto the next train. In the chaos, Robert Todd Lincoln was knocked off the platform. Before his inevitable demise, being crushed by the heavy machinery, a hand reached out and caught the scruff of his coat. The hand belonged to Edwin Booth, famous actor and brother of John Wilkes Booth. In a moment of even more eerie foreshadowing, Edwin was traveling that day with John T. Ford, the owner of the Ford's Theater. Now, you might be asking yourself, where is the security? How could these people get so close to a president of the United States? These were very different times. Presidents viewed security as a hindrance. They got between themselves and the people. It would take one more assassination to change this view in America. On September 6, 1901, William McKinley was greeting the crowd at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York. He was shaking hands and kissing babies when Leon Shogat stepped forward with a 32 caliber revolver hidden under a handkerchief. He fired twice before the crowd piled onto him. McKinley, bleeding from his wound, stopped the crowd from beating Shogat in a frenzy of vigilante justice and had him dragged away. Just a short eight days later, McKinley would be dead. Unlike Guteau, who suffered from delusions of grandeur, and longed for it to be in some way memorialized. Shogat thought of himself as a nobody, a victim of the system. Of his crime, he simply said, I did my part. For a time, he even used the alias Fred Neiman or Fred Nobody. Shogat was inspired to act after the assassination of King Umberto I in Italy and by the speeches of known anarchist Emma Goldman. Early on, there was a thought that Shogat may have been part of a greater anarchist movement determined to take down the United States government. Despite this belief, it is mostly thought that Leon acted alone. Many of the anarchists he tried to meet over the years and learn more about their beliefs thought he was a spy and warned others about him. He was convicted as a lone killer, executed by electric chair, and had his body dissolved in acid. Eleven years after the assassination of William McKinley, John Schrank claimed to be visited by his ghost. Schrank stated that McKinley's ghost was seeking revenge for his assassination, and he blamed his own vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, to be the catalyst of his ultimate demise. Schrank's bullet struck Roosevelt in the chest, just behind the breast pocket. Thankfully for Roosevelt, and for history... Roosevelt was a long-winded speaker. His 50-plus page speech was in his pocket, folded in half, along with his eyeglass case. The speech saved his life. He turned to the crowd and said, I don't know whether you fully understand. I have just been shot. It takes more than that to kill a bull moose. He then spoke for an hour and a half with a bullet lodged in his muscle just before his fourth rib, before seeking medical attention. The final story I want to look at today is the attempted assassination of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. On February 15th, 1933, five shots were fired on a sunny day in Miami, Florida. All five struck flesh, but none hit the president. As is the case with so many of these stories, the crowd quickly captured and subdued the assassin. Giuseppe Zangara pled guilty to attempted murder and blamed capitalism for his crime. However, some don't believe it was this simple. The five bullets struck four bystanders, a Margaret Cruz, who suffered only a hand wound, Russell Caldwell, who was struck in the head, a woman noted in the papers as Miss Joseph Gill, shot in the abdomen, and finally, a New York police detective, William Sinnott. The fifth and final bullet struck the man beside the president. He was Chicago Mayor Anton Cermak. It was this bullet that would go on to spot much speculation and conspiracy.
it is believed by many that Cermak was the actual target that day. This conspiracy suggests that Zangara was hired by Chicago mob boss Frank the Enforcer Nitty. For years, Nitty was the chief lieutenant and right-hand man to notorious gangster Al Capone. When Capone went to prison in October 1931, Nitty stepped up as the head of the family. Some reports suggest that this was only in the eyes of the media and that it was Paul the waiter Rica that was actually the true boss. This, of course, is relevant to our story because, as the nickname suggests, Nitty was the enforcer. Nitty orchestrated many of the hits at this time, including the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. If a hit were to be put out on Anton Cermak, it would be Nitty who would see it followed through. Why would Chicago's Southside mob want Sir Mac dead? The simple answer, Sir Mac, who came into office in 1931, just like our boy Nitty, declared war on organized crime. This is not the entire story, of course. Sir Mac was in league with the North Side and the remnants of Bugs Marone's gang. On December 19th, 1932, detectives Harry Lang and Harry Miller along with a team of officers, stormed room 551 of 221 North LaSalle in Chicago, Illinois. This was the office of Frank Nitty. As the police rounded up Nitty's employees, Officer Lang rushed into his office. Four shots rang out. Three hit Nitty and one hit Lang. Nitty would survive. In a later court case, Miller would state that Lang was paid $15,000 by Cermak to take out Nitty and that he shot himself in the arm to make it look like Nitty shot first. We all know that Han shot first. It, would be, it wouldn't be surprising if a few months later, Nitty would turn the tables on Cermak. What exactly happened on this day is lost in history. One of the best reasons given that Zangara would in fact hit his target is the fact that Zangara was a sharpshooter in the Italian military. However, he was a sharpshooter with a rifle not the pistol he was using that day. Also, given his short stature, he was standing on a chair. Finally, a nearby witness was smacking Zangara with her purse after the first shot, causing every other shot to go awry. Zangara would be an odd choice for Nitty. Again, this is the man that orchestrated the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Subtlety was not Nitty's strong suit. This is a man of Tommy guns and slaughter, not precision attacks. So, what happened to Nitty? Ten years later, Nitty would find himself drunk and alone with a gunshot in the head on the railroad tracks in North Riverside. Officially, Nitty took his own life that day. The legends state that as the pressures closed in, his own men turned against him. They told him to take the fall for the outfit or face the consequences. There are many other theories as to what happened that day as well as other stories, but those are all tales for another time. Till next time, I'm Christopher Damien, and this is History Mystery in the Unexplained. Thank you for listening.